Hello and welcome to Stratford Paddock. My name is Joe and we are joined once again for a one-on-one -on -one interview with Darmesh Sheth from Sky Sports News. Darmesh, there's loads to talk about. Maybe not transfers as much today, although the, don't worry, I will be pestering you about transfers. But there's been actually changes, big moves at big levels at Manchester United in the last few days. Very exciting times for United. Yeah, uh, Joe, um, thanks for having me back on. I yeah. know it's not fashionable in recent memory to have anything positive to say about what's going on behind the scenes at Manchester United but mm. you can't help but be a little bit impressed about what's happened this week with this appointment only because it just feels like even though it's not been formally ratified Ineos had basically you know made a mm. statement here yeah um, I mean while we wait for yeah while we wait for that formal ratification they are making moves and we would keep saying that, you know, everything that happens at Manchester United football operations wise will will go through Ineos and they'll have to be consulted. I think what's happened this week is a big, big example of that. Yeah, I mean, so obviously we're talking about United's new CEO, uh, Omar Barada. Mm. It's not um, not a, a, a speculation. It's not something that, you know, has been sort of rumoured here, there and everywhere. It has been done. It has been announced by the club. Since we last spoke last week, this guy's name had not crossed my radar whatsoever. No. I hadn't heard his name spoken in relation to Manchester United until, when was it, Saturday, when the story was broken um, by, by, I think, David Ornstein initially. And then, yeah. like you said, just quickly before we came live, around an hour later, it was being confirmed by Manchester United. No speculation, yes. no rumours, no approach yeah. and targeting this, that and the other. It was, it is done. What do you make of this? Is it a bit of a coup that United uh, have, 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 say, signed, but sort of brought in Omar Brada from Manchester City, of course? And what do you make of the fact as well, the way they did it? Silent, deadly, you know, no rumours, no hysteria. He's in. You've hit the nail on the head. It, it does feel like a coup because of where he's come from mm. and the job that he's done at Manchester City before he's come to Manchester United. Now... Very soon after David Ornstein broke that story, you said it there, it, there was hardly any time between that and the actual official announcement that Manchester City had announced he'd left and Manchester United had announced that he was going to become their new chief executive officer. Now, on the face of it, people will say this is not a step up. And Manchester City will always argue that they have the upper hand on every single metric when it comes to football operations uh, up against Manchester United. And it's hard to argue with that because of the recent success they've had, the structure and the infrastructure that they have in place at that club. But for him, for Omar Barada himself, this is a promotion because he was the COO of the City Football Group. Is effectively the you know, a step down, uh, the, the second in line, if you like, in the hierarchy there at Manchester City. He's come into a big club like Manchester United. He's the top dog. He is the chief executive at Manchester United. And not only that, the manner in which it was done. I was told that it was quick, it was quiet, it was collaborative, and significantly, once Omar Barada heard of United's interest and once he'd spoken to people at Ineos, he says it was effectively impossible for him to say no to this job. And I think that in itself is a great nod to what Ineos have done since they've arrived at that club and a real statement of intent on how they want to do their business. Very behind the scenes, just pinpoint what they want and get the deal done. And that's exactly what seems to have happened in this case. And if you look at what he's done for Manchester City and what he could potentially do for Manchester United, I would say two things. One, the job that he's done at City has been incredible because look at Manchester City at the moment. But also, if you look at it from an Ineos perspective, this is an almost a top-down approach that they've taken. I know we've been on this podcast every week, Joe, and the, the first question we're asked, Oh, can Manchester United get somebody on loan? Of course, that's going to be in the remit. They want to bring in players. But I think Ineos are looking at this in a different way. They have realised that 
the current structure is unsustainable and they can't carry on like this. So if there is going to be short term pain, they're willing to accept it because they know they need to get the structure right. So what have they done? They've gone right to the top of the structure and said, this is the best man for the job. And they've got him in, in no time. What are they going to do next? Alongside Omar Barada, even though he's still a city employee, make no mistake about it, he will be consulted on every single position that becomes available at United now. And you would think the next step would be sporting director level and then recruitment team level, instead of the other way around, where they're thinking, do we need to bring in somebody on loan on a short-term basis to help out Rasmus Hoyland? Yes, Manchester United probably do. Is it the biggest priority as far as that football club is concerned right now? Probably not. They need to get everything right, structure-wise, infrastructure-wise, and what better way to start than to bring in someone who is widely regarded as one of the best, be it at Barcelona, be it at Manchester City, and now at Manchester United. Yeah, it's almost like United for so long we've we've concentrated more on getting the new Xbox or the new TV when actually if you go upstairs the roof has completely blown off the house. The, the you know rain and wind are coming straight like we we focus on the things that look flashy and look nice on the pitch and obviously, you know, at, at the end of the day the players are the ones who win you the games in the moment. But if you don't get that recruitment right and you don't get all the layers above that people making bad decisions, people making the wrong moves, it doesn't really matter who you buy because things won't work out anyway, as we've seen for, you know, over a decade now at United. So, yeah, to me, this is massively yeah, just, exciting. Just one other thing I'd say as mm. well. I think when that appointment was made, initially, yes, you know, what a coup, but there was quite a lot of noise on social media. What is going to happen with regard to these 115 charges? Mm-hmm. You would think, you would think that a club like Manchester United, a a, um, a minority investment like Ineos, who have been in and around sporting organisations and big ones for a long, long time, will have done a whole load of due diligence mm. on every aspect of this deal before they decided to appoint someone like Omar Barada. That's all I'll say on that, yeah. because... Obviously, there was going to be that noise associated with a move that involves Manchester City, particularly if that person wants to go to United. I'd, I'd be very shocked, though, if um, if Omar Barado or any individual at Man City was given personal charges, you know, that they had to take. You'd think that any sort of punishment would be a club thing like we've seen with Everton so far, wouldn't you? I mean, what was it? One banker during the 2008 banking crash went to prison. I doubt anyone from Man City is going to be <laughs> facing any personal charges. Although, how Manchester United would it be if we got a new CEO in, huh. nicked him from City, everyone thinks it's this massive coup, and he ends up in jail in 18 months because of all the charges at Man City? That would be the most us thing ever. But hopefully, that isn't a concern. And like you said, they will have looked at that, you would hope. Finally, we've got some people in at United who actually look one or two steps ahead rather than thinking, you know, what's the, what do we need right now on the pitch? And I'm going to ask you that question because I still want to know what's going on on the pitch. Transfers mm. wise, United still targeting a, targeting a striker, Chupo Motin. We mentioned him last week. In the last few days, I've seen a, a few reports out of France. I don't know how much validity there is to those that things are maybe slightly advancing there. Do you think that's still an option? Is that likely? Are things moving forward as far as you're aware? Uh, sorry, Joe, look, at the risk of re repeating myself, <laughs> all I will say at this stage is, no, and genuinely, all I'll say at this stage is United have their eyes open in the market. Yeah. It looks like that they're looking at the loan market. Those names are still the same names that we've been hearing about. Eric Chupo yeah. Moting, Bobby Broby as well from Ajax. I'm told with those at this moment in time, they are not hot with okay. regard to Manchester United. That can change because we've still got a little bit of time left in this transfer window and things, particularly loan moves, can happen towards the end of the window. And Manchester United, in the last couple of windows, have had a history of waiting until deadline day. Marcel Sabitzer this time last year. And of course, the two loan signings they made, plus a permanent signing in Altai Bay India and Sofian Amrabat and mm -hmm. um, Sergio Reguilón on deadline day in the summer. So you can't rule anything out. Would it surprise me if United ended this window and didn't sign anyone? No, it wouldn't at all. Would, would it be disappointing for United fans? 
of course it would. But I think with this Omar Barada um, appointment mm. in the back of your mind, I think it's one of those where they're looking more at the long term uh, issues that Manchester United have rather than the mm. short term fixes, which from the outside, it feels United have lurched from one to another, it seems, yeah. in the last 10 to 15 years. I think they want to get out of that. Mm. However long it takes, that's what is required now. Because as you as a United fan will always say, yes, oh, they made these really good signings. And then if the manager doesn't work out, are they going to make another whole host of new signings? They want to get out of that. They want to get out of that. They want to make sure that they've got a streamlined squad whereby they can go into the market and buy the players that they can bring in on committee, chief executive, sporting director, recruitment team, with the manager having an input in that deal, as opposed to we've got to sort the manager out here because we mm. seem to have let him down. We haven't brought anyone in. Who does he want? Let's try and get this deal done. That's the problem that they've had. And that's what they want to get out of. And that's why the Glazers have said, even though it's only 25% minority investment, the football operations are yours, Ineos. Yeah. Go and look after it. <clears throat> and that is an admission of failure in itself mm -hmm. in the last 15 years since they've been at the club. In the, amongst other things that Manchester United will point to, of course. But in particular, that's what's happened at the football club. And they've realised they haven't done the right thing. This is now... It almost feels like last chance saloon now, United. If this doesn't work, where do they go? Yeah. Where do they go? Because they need to get these appointments right. And if this one is anything to go by, then suddenly I think a lot of United fans are thinking, this feels different. Yeah. It, we didn't I mean, know about this at all. Yeah. yeah. This is the biggest shake-up to the sort of the structures at Manchester United in nearly exactly. 20 years. I mean, certainly since um, David Gill and Manchester United, uh, and Manchester United, he basically is Man United, but Sir Alex Ferguson left. Um, just a, a, an interesting part, and we mentioned this on the podcast yesterday, but just want your take on this. You mentioned about how the Glazers almost admitted wrongdoing or defeat or, you know, problems with the fact that they've given the football in operations to Ineos yeah. and to Jim Ratcliffe. In the in the, the the official statement from Manchester United, obviously this is, this statement isn't written by um, Jim Ratcliffe, but the second line in this is the club is determined to put football and performance on the pitch back at the heart of everything we do. Omar's appointment represents the first step on this journey. That to me is slightly pointed, and to say something is being put back somewhere, that means to say that football and performance on the pitch weren't at the heart of everything we've been doing recently. That, to me, the phrasing of that is, yeah. is very damning as well. That is one way to look at it. But the other way to look at that is, it's clear that it hasn't been because of what's happened with results. Yeah, It's been over a decade now since Manchester United won the Premier League title. Mm -hmm. They've been through numerous managers. They've been through numerous players and in excess of a billion pounds trying to get this right that could be a nod towards that in that mm. to bring football operations back to the heart of what's happening at manchester united i think simply by handing over the football operations to ineos was that admission yeah that it hasn't been at the forefront potentially they've got by they've still managed to sign these big name players for mm. big money look what manchester united can still do even if they're not performing Despite. as well as they can on the pitch. Look at the pulling power. Look mm. at the fact, oh, Manchester United not in the Champions League, but they can still sign these players. This is amazing. It's unsustainable because there's going to come a time where the success on the pitch has to count for something. And the success on the pitch has to generate money for the football club because now we're in an era where we have profitability and sustainability rules, which some people say, oh, it doesn't matter. It matters. Mm. It matters now because people, uh, clubs are getting punished now. Every single club has to be very, very wary of this. Hence why United, slowly but surely, even in this transfer window, even though uh, fans are calling out for players to arrive, yeah. the main crux of it has been departures. And yeah. some of them have been young players and academy products who Manchester United fans will think, why are we doing that? We need to give these players a chance. They have. And yeah. some of them have succeeded. Kobe Mainu, Alejandro Jarnacho, 
they have succeeded. They're in the first team. Some of them have been given the chance and maybe the management have, think, have thought they're quite, not quite ready yet. Mm. Is there a way we can do a deal whereby the club can still make money, but we can still be in a position where we can take advantage of their talent if in the longer run we can buy these players back? Mm. So they're trying to insert all of it. And I think that that is maybe something that Ineos have looked at and thought, they're not selling properly at this football club. Mm. And if they are going to sell, let's be in a position where, you know, we don't lose all um, ownership, if you like, on a certain player. So Medjbury, yes, it'll be fantastic if he does well because we can still make money, but it'd be fantastic if he does well because, you know, the manager might think he can still do a job here mm -hmm. and we'll be able to bring him back on, on a fee that would suit Manchester United's finances. So mm -hmm. that is what they're trying to do here. Even though they are letting go of these players, do it in a way whereby it's going to be to the benefit of the club. Yeah, and I think with a lot of the outs, particularly the youngsters, I think there's there's an instinctive sort of, oh no, don't let them go because they might become good. They might be the next Paul Scholes or mm -hmm. David Beckham or you know Marcus Rashford or whatever. But the other thing to remember is there was plenty of academy players that came through alongside and after the class of 92 that didn't make it, that did get sold. And, yeah. the, you know, the the thing that we trusted back in those days was the ability to the to a large degree of, of Sir Alex Ferguson to say he's good enough, he's not, he's not. And there's very few that left other than Gerard Piquet, who I think that situation was slightly different anyway because of his inclination to rejoin Barcelona. There are very few that left mm. where you go, ah, oh, we shouldn't have let him go. Very few players, academy players, uh, yeah. left Man United and, and became world class. So, you know, Garnacho and Maynou have made it. Joe, this is not yeah, this is not a Manchester again. United yeah. thing. Joe, this is not a Manchester United thing. This is a football thing. Yeah. And I think Manchester United have an acceptance, as do every single club in the Premier League or anywhere in the world, that every single academy graduate is not going to make it. So what they want to do is one of two things when they have an academy generate talent is number one can they bring these players through into the first team and if that can't work and in the majority of cases it doesn't happen that way because for every garnacho and kobe minu that makes it there are another five or ten that aren't going to make it but what happens to those five or ten is what united are trying to change here and what other clubs seem to have been successful at and that is can you still make an investment on these players if they're not going to make it into the first team? That's what they're trying to do now. So the likes of Hannibal Bedgebury, Facundo Palestri, who I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about in, in a moment, Alvaro Fernandez, and previously in, in other transfer windows like Anthony Alanga to a certain extent, James Garner, Zidane Iqbal, Charlie Savage. If they're not going to make it, However much fans might say, oh, look at Alanga now. Look how well he's doing at Forest. Why isn't he at United? Maybe he wasn't good enough for United. Maybe that's what they decided, rightly or wrongly. But the primary focus then is to make an investment out of these players. And if they can move these players on, be it on loan for a loan fee with an option for a good option price or for a permanent deal or for performance-related deals whereby their price goes up, the better they perform. And to the extent where they might be able to bring them back, then that in itself has to be a plus. It's not the number one plus because they want to make them Manchester United first team players. That is the intention. It can't always happen. You can't always do that. So the next step is to make sure that they generate investment. Yeah. I mean, speaking of investment, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next question because we've seen in the last day or two this rumour and idea of I don't think Sancho is particularly surprising but this United are looking to try and recoup somewhere in the region of 100 million for Jadon Sancho and Anthony now this is the first mm. sort of real heavy rumours that Anthony is 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 being willing to or United are willing to to sell Anthony we're in his second season halfway through it now the first the second season has been worse than the first one and the first one was you know okay at best 
Is, is there any truth in this? United already willing to let Anthony go. And also, is this off the back maybe of these sort of suggestions and rumours that Omar Barad is very keen on giving players one or two years to prove themselves and any more than that and, and, and you'll be gone. You don't get three, four, five years at the club to maybe turn things around eventually like we've seen with certain players. Maybe Martial, you could put on that list, even Paul Pogba to a certain extent. You keep waiting for the player to arrive that you think you bought. Are we going to cut our, loss, our losses on the likes of Anthony and Jaden Sancho? The the Anthony one, I've not heard. I've only read the rumours that you've read. I think what's going to happen is a lot of what happens at United is going to be reassessed in the summer. Because you would think by then, Ineos will have their feet under the table. And they will have some sort of structure in place. We're already seeing it now. Barada in. We're bound to see one or two sporting directors in situ by the summer, simply because they'll have to, because the summer is when Manchester United will have to go for it in both incomings and outgoings in the transfer window. That's going to be the first opportunity where, real opportunity where we're going to see Ineos, you know, show what they're about. That's why there's pressure on them, I think, still. And then you'll have a recruitment team in place then as well. And you'll have six months of the season, the, the, the second half of the season that will have elapsed. And that will not only be an audition for some of the players that are at the club, but obviously the coaching staff and the manager as well. They're going to assess everything. So for us to say right now, Anthony's gone in the summer, we can't say that for 100% because number one, we don't know how he's going to perform for the rest of this season, first of all. Number two, do we know with a degree of 100% certainty who the manager at Manchester United is going to be? Because I can sit here and say to you, they're not going to get rid of Eric Ten Hag. But I can't tell you how Manchester United are going to perform in the next six months. If they don't qualify for Europe and the, the season is bad and they don't win a trophy, I don't know what Ineos are going to decide. What, what will they think? I think, is Eric Ten Hag the right guy? Are we going to take into account everything that he had to put up with, be it injuries, all the off-field problems as well, and do we now give him the final year of his contract to be able to turn things around? Or is this the time for them to think, right, we're going to recruit players and we're going to recruit a manager who we think is going to work with that identity. It could be Eric Ten Hag. It might be someone else. And is Anthony part of that? Is Jaden Sancho part of that? Or are they not? Jaden Sancho has got six months of an audition himself, whereby he can perform really well for Borussia Dortmund. And one of two things can happen. He can come back to Manchester United, which might be a very different Manchester United to the one he's left, and maybe given another opportunity at United. Or his market value might go up and he'll be sold on. By the same token, Anthony, if he performs well for Manchester United in the next six months, is he then fighting for his, for his future? Or will United think about, we're not going to get too much money for him in the summer. Is there a possibility of a loan to a European club where he might perform a little bit better just to raise his market value because he's on a long-term contract still at United? There's all of these options that will be open to Manchester United with every single one of their players. We're just talking about a couple simply because Anthony hasn't performed well and Jaden Sancho has gone on loan to Borussia Dortmund. You can start talking about loads of players that are in the United squad at the moment who haven't been performing well, who might be on an audition toward the end of the season. So I think everything will more or less come to a head in the summer because that's when you would think there will be some sort of structure in place at United. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of that structure, one name that <laughs> is worth mentioning, I think, in the last few hours even, um, Newcastle's uh, Dan Ashworth, their sort of sporting director, um, has been mentioned a lot. There was, I think Fabrizio Romano mentioned it. I've seen it in The Independent as well. And just, you know, you see these things on social media picking up a bit of pace. Is there anything in the in the Dan Ashworth stuff? Is I think he's he's a, sort of a friend of Dave Brailsford, and he's well aware, well known by Ineos. And you know, is that a target for Manchester United in that sporting director role underneath Barada? I, I, look, I think the names that um, people are looking at and linking to Manchester United are Ashworth, Paul Mitchell, yeah, as well Doogie Friedman as well. There's there's talk it might not just be one sporting director 
Mm. It might be more than one sporting director. But what I do know is even though the, the start date for Omar Barada has not been set in stone yet, because I don't know whether it's gardening leave or whether it's uh, seeing out the rest of a certain part of his contract before he can leave, how much notice he needs to give to Manchester City, even though he can't work directly for United, make no mistake about it, the people that are going to have to come into this structure, they're going to have to be consulted. Uh, Omar Barada is going to have to be consulted. So Ineos and Omar uh, Barada are going to be doing this together. Ineos might pinpoint one or two sporting directors, but Barada is going to have to be, um, you know, it's going to have to be put, put across him. He's going to be saying, well, we're interested in this guy. If you have a situation where Ineos choose someone and Barada's like, cannot work with him or her, I can't work with them. Sorry, are, are Ineos seriously going to employ that person? Possibly, but it would have to take a lot of discussions and and maybe changing Barada's mind to think, no, we think that this is going to work. So in an ideal scenario, it's going to be somebody that Barada can work with and Ineos can work with. So they're going to have to have a lot of talks here about who, who's going to come into that position because aside of now the chief executive, you would think that the next role that they're going to need to fill is that sporting director role. And for me, it could be one of the most important appointments alongside Barada that we've seen in recent memory at United because it is going to be so important who comes into that club in that position now. Yeah, massive. Um, just back to transfers a little bit then. Any other outgoings to mention? Because like I said, we've had a couple of youngsters go in, um, mentions here and there of people maybe going elsewhere for game time. Any other players that United are looking to offload either in January or maybe even looking ahead to the summer? Uh, the one that's live at the moment is still Facundo Palestri. And I know we've been talking okay. about this throughout this transfer window. Granada still want to do a deal, but there's no final agreement as it stands just now, only because the loan deal that would be involved would imply, you know, salary apportion. Now, the noises we're hearing at the moment are Granada not wanting to pay as much of the salary that maybe Manchester United would want them to pay. So okay. maybe there's a little bit of a stall in, in that deal just now, not to the point that it can't happen, mm -hmm. but there's going to have to be a compromise. And that can happen in many ways. Can Granada raise the amount that they pay in a loan fee or can Manchester United raise the amount that they might pay in the wages that, that would be apportioned to uh, Facundo Palestri for the rest of this season? So... I think judging by everything that's going on just now, it seems that that might be his preferred destination to go to Spain and play for Granada. Mm -hmm. But that's easier said than done because both clubs would need to agree. And United are going, we've, we've seen throughout this transfer window, they will do it on their terms. So United will continue to negotiate with Granada to make sure that they get the deal that is beneficial to them as well as Granada as well. So that one is continuing, but I think Granada are well aware that there are other clubs like PSV Eindhoven who are just waiting in the wings there that once that that deal, if it doesn't happen, they could be ready to jump in. Great. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it makes sense, doesn't it? He's not really had much game time at all um, this season, literally just the fleeting substitute appearance here and there. So yeah, makes sense to me. Right, that's going to be all from us. Thank you for coming on, Damage. And finally, something's happened at Manchester United. It's not just speculation. United have brought in a new CEO. Great to hear. As good as all your sort of knowledge on that and your kind of behind the scenes of how that deal unfolded and the fact that, you know, it's, it was a surprise. Man City aren't particularly happy about it. And United seem to have got someone that's actually got a football background who's done good things in football in the past rather than just, you know, oh, you're nearby, you can be the new CEO. Mm. Uh, maybe that's slightly disrespectful to people who've been there before, but it's very exciting times for Manchester United. Thank you very much for coming on, Darmish. We'll have you on again. Is it it's transfer deadline day special next, isn't it? It's that time already. Oh, Nearly next there. week. Next Nearly week, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back on. Hopefully, you can be announcing Brian Broby. There'll be <laughs> Chupo moting stat packs and pro player profiles that we can go through. And United are bringing in loads of different players. That'll be next week's uh, episode, hopefully. But thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for joining us at home as well. This has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Damesh Sheth from Sky Sports News. We'll see you in a bit.